Hello YouTube! In this video we will compare four different ultra-wide angle 16 to 35mm f4 full frame zoom lenses. Two of them cost a bit more than thousand dollars US, but this is still a somewhat economic category, which is a very inviting reason to buy one of these instead of the f2.8s that cost quite a bit more money. This will be a mega shootout between Canon, Nikon, Sony and Tokina all mounted on a Sony A7S and an A7R2 full-frame mirrorless cameras. Even a Nikon D810 will briefly appear. Some lens adapters will be used as well. The first up in the running of this contest is a piece of Canon glass that was released in 2014 that offers a long overdue alternative to Canon's classic 2003 model 17-40mm f4 as well as the well-established f2.8 versions. I have seen positive reviews on this f4 version's image sharpness, among other things, so I think that we can expect a lot from this lens. This is the only ultra-wide-angle full-frame zoom lens that Canon has ever made with image stabilization built into the lens. That's good, because ultra-wide-angle lenses don't always come with optical stabilization, so it would seem to be a good choice for handheld video recording. Personally, I think that this lens will win the shootout. Next up is the Nikon 16-35mm lens that might be the best competitor to the Canon. The Nikon has quite a reputation to live up to, especially where image quality is concerned, save for the fact that many of its positive reviews antedate the existence of the 2014 Canon version, as this Nikkor was released in 2010, four years before the Canon counterpart emerged to give a challenge, in a non-direct sense of course. These two lenses cannot mount natively on the same camera to compare them head to head that way, so normally they are tested in isolation from each other, meaning on separate cameras. Here we are going to mount both of them on the same camera and directly correlate the data, sometimes in 42 megapixels. We will see who comes out on top now. The next lens in this shootout is a very welcomed one from Sony as this 2014 model is the smallest and lightest in the running, and also is the only lens in the contest that does not require an adapter to mount onto the camera. Like the Canon and Nikon 16-35mm lenses, it has optical stabilization, a perk that is more likely to be found in the f4 series of ultra-wide zooms than the f2.8s. However, one detail that isn't so welcome is that it is the most expensive lens in the running, so hopefully it delivers the goods. I have to say, though, that based on its reputation, there are reasons to curb high expectations from this lens, but optimism is still sustainable with the Sony because the form factor of this lens is just so endearing. Besides, why shouldn't a Sony lens perform best on a Sony body? Several reasons, actually but there are also reasons why it could. So stay tuned and we will put it through its paces. Last up in the running of this contest, and probably the least known about, as though it were discontinued or something, is the Tokina lens. If the reports are true, then this lens just might be the crossroads where performance and low retail price intersect. But although it was released back in 2011, it is strangely hard to find, especially on the used market where it can be had for very cheap. Not even lens rentals in Tennessee or borrow lenses in San Carlos list this lens in their inventory. Anyway, on the retail market, this lens is one of the cheapest full-frame ultra-wide-angle zoom lenses available, if not the cheapest. This lens is reported by some to have the most rectilinear images with little or no curvature, something that is very hard to avoid in the teen millimeters. So we will find out if that is true or not. I'm not much of a gambler, and I would be quite amused if this lens won the shootout, but since the race does belong to the swiftest, I wouldn't bet against the competition either. To be honest, I don't think that the Tokina will win. 
and I scripted all my opinions up to this point before doing any testing. So there are no spoilers here. So before we begin the examination, here is a quick overview of the main categories of the shootout. Note that this video has the benefit of videography in mind, and that chapter selections are available in the video description below, so you could just skip ahead to whatever test you want. All in-camera lens compensations will be disabled at all times, and whenever I say or show the Tokina lens as 16mm, it really means 17mm, so just be aware of that. Let's get started, shall we? We start off with lens mounting, something that might seem trivial, because it is, but you might be surprised to know how stiff some lenses and adapters are to mount, so let's check it out anyways, okay? We will start off by mounting the Comlight EF to FE mount adapter that goes on very nicely, and so does the Canon lens. No issues there, so off they come, and on goes the second FE mount adapter I will be using just to try it out, a Sigma MC11, and oh my word is it ever stiff to mount. It is so tight that it feels like trying to overcome interlocking gears or something then it feels like it shifts in varied increments until finally mounting on all the way. After several attempts, most of the initial struggles subsided because I got the hang of it, but it felt unnatural and I didn't like it. What a shame. Fortunately, the Canon lens mounted to the other end just as smoothly as it did in the Comlight adapter. So now goes on my Photodiox FX to FE mount adapter, and it was a tight fit onto the camera, but not too bad, and slightly stiff to dismount as well. The Nikon lens mounted to the photodiox even better than the Canon did into the Comlight. Off it comes, nicely. Now the Sony doesn't need an adapter, but it mounted to the body just as well as the Nikon did into the photodiox adapter. Now to mount the Tokina lens, the Comlight adapter goes back on, and the Tokina mounted effortlessly, so no issues there. Now the dreaded Sigma adapter goes back on the body, but the lens was pleasant to mount. In summary, the Sony is the easiest to mount simply because it does not require an adapter. But that's it, because the Canon, Nikon, and Tokina lenses all fit onto my adapters just fine. So they all tied for second place. The real challenge here actually turned out to be in mounting an adapter to the camera, but note that in previous videos I did, one lens was excessively loose and another was too stiff, so inconsistencies can happen. Okay, enough of that. Now let's move on to the focus ring performance test, where we start off in fourth place with the Nikon lens, as it proved to have the lesser of greater focus rings in this shootout. The drag is simply too weak, and so the start and the finish of a direction of travel did not have a good ease-in and ease-out feel to it. The travel path itself was not smooth and felt gritty. The surface area and the ridges of the grip are alright, but only better than the Sony's. Audibly, the Nikon's focus ring sounded the loudest and scratchiest. I totally forgot to record a sample of the Sony's. Rats. My bad. But it was similar to the Canon's though. The focus ring turns only 60 degrees, which is subjective, but I prefer a 90 degree travel path for more precise, manually focused video work. Not everybody agrees though. That's just my opinion. Overall, that was a pretty poor performance by the Nikon. So now let's move on to the next lens in third place, and that is the Sony. While the travel path was as smooth as anything, the problem is that the tension of the drag was too soft. It needs to be firmer. The grip on the ring was the worst of the four, as it was too thin. The ridges were too shallow, and they were level with the parts on either side of the focus ring without a gap so I had problems with my fingers sometimes rubbing along the casing and or the zoom ring. At least the sound of the Sony's focus ring was smooth. The focus ring turns over a very long travel path when turned slowly, 
but over a much shorter travel path when turned quickly. As a videographer, I would prefer a mechanical focus connection for manual focused video work over an electronic one any day. So unfortunately for the Sony, this is a demerit. I know that most videoers out there already agree with me about that, but many photographers might not care. Now, even though this lens is a focus by wire, I actually didn't struggle with it as much as I did when testing out the fly-by-wire on the FE 24-70mm f4 lens. Admittedly, the focusing on this 16-35mm version actually felt somewhat mechanical for a fly-by-wire. Oh, I missed on that last one. So I didn't get them all. Anyway, the Sony lens also had the only focus ring in this competition without hard stops in manual mode at both ends. So you could find yourself turning it past infinity without knowing it. Another thumbs down. Overall, the Sony's focus ring only turned out an okay performance, because some improvements are definitely needed. Okay, next... And second place goes to the Tokina, where things start to get good. Just like the Sony, the travel path feels very smooth to operate, and the Tokina's drag is a pinch firmer. But it is still not stiff enough to achieve a lofty place. But it is close, though. The focus ring was a bit scratchy sounding, that sounded better than the Nikon, but worse than the Sony and the Canon. So here they are again. The Tokina turns 80 degrees and had the second best grip on it, as it is somewhat wide and quite grippy, and stood out from the Nikon and especially the Sony. By the way, the focus mode switch is the focus ring itself. I never use it since I only use manual mode anyway. But in automatic mode, unlike in manual, it has no hard stops. Indeed, this focus ring was a pleasant experience for video recording, and so overall, that was a very good performance by the Tokina. Okay, finally we come to the Canon in first place that took everyone to the cleaners. The travel path was as smooth to turn as the Sony's and the Tokina's were, but the important difference here is that the Canon's drag was dampened perfectly having just the right amount of stiffness for achieving nice ease-in and ease-out sensitivity. The Canon nailed it. The travel path turns 90 degrees and sounded less scratchy than the Tokina and the Nikon. The Canon's focus ring was the widest of the four and has good ridges on it for a grip that felt even better than the Tokina's. Overall, that was an excellent performance by the Canon. Now it's time to move on to the next category and take a look at the performance of the zoom rings. We start out in fourth place with the Nikon lens again. Compared to the other lenses, the first thing I found with the Nikkor zoom ring was that the drag was too weak, so the ease in and ease out touch was not there. The zoom rings travel around the path sounded gritty to the ears and felt rigid to the touch. So the Nikon sounded the roughest of the four, followed by the Canon, then the Tokina, then the Sony sounded the smoothest. In this scene I am trying to zoom very slowly with one hand, and as you can see the footage is very jerky. Now I am zooming with two hands, and the footage is better, but a good zoom ring should only require one hand. Here they are side by side for comparison. At least the zoom ring felt alright, and it was easy enough to grip. The travel path turns 80 degrees from 16 to 35 millimeters, which I liked because that is a decent amount of degrees in the turn to help any lens achieve smoother zooming in video. Overall though, the Nikon zoom ring turned out a poor performance. Check out what this article said, that the zoom ring is smooth and precise and that the focus ring is smooth, precise, and well damped. Well, I disagree. Moving on and coming in at third place was the Canon lens. 
even though it was so good. Basically, the Canon, Sony, and Tokina lens all felt good overall, in terms of operating smoothly and not feeling rough or gritty, and that is partly why the footage from all three of them zooming one and two-handed were all comparable. Here is a sample of the Canon and Nikon side by side for comparison, and I think that the Nikon was the only lens in this video that benefited from two-handed zooming. But the primary aspect that separated the Canon, Sony, and Tokina was their levels of drag. In the Canon's case, I felt that the zoom ring needed to be a bit stiffer. The Canon tied with the Tokina lens for having the best grip on the zoom ring. One could easily find them without even looking as the rubber ridges were ideal to the touch. The zoom ring turns a shorter throw of 56 degrees from 16 to 35 millimeters. And as we already heard, the Canon sounded a little less scratchy than the Nikon but not by much. Overall, the Canon turned out a good performance that was only barely edged out by the Sony and the Tokina. Moving along now to the Tokina zoom ring in second place, that is slightly smoother to operate than the Canon, and just as good as the Sony. However, its only small limitation was that unlike my slow and medium speed zoom pulls, the Tokina's fast zoom pulls were too stiff. I had to exert a bit more force on it than I did with the other lenses. That aside, the drag in the Tokina's zoom ring was roughly equal to the Canon. Only the Sony lens sounded smoother to the ear. The Tokina turns 60 degrees from one end to the other, and was only better overall than the Canon's zoom ring by a small measure. And finally in first place is the Sony, and this lens left little to complain about. The drag was just right, giving that perfect ease-in and ease-out sensitivity, and the feel of the ring was also just right, not too weak or too stiff. The travel path sounded the smoothest, But a minor thing I didn't prefer about it was the shorter travel path of only 30 degrees. Although that is subjective, and some people will like that. Another minor thing was that, although the Sony's grip was nice and wide, it was not quite as comfortable to the touch as the Canon's and the Tokina's, as the ridges were too small, and the grip is right next to the focus ring, so sometimes they feel like the same thing when you are trying to grab it without looking. Otherwise, it was my favorite zoom ring in the shootout, as the Sony turned out an excellent performance. Now it is time for a fun quiz with all four lenses set at the widest angle in 16mm for three of them, but the Tokina is in 17mm. So can you tell which one that is? One of these images is 1mm tighter than the rest. It's this one. If you are watching this on a cell phone, you will not see it. But if you look closely in 1080, the difference is there. Pardon the Canon and the Sony for being out of focus. But at 35mm, the Nikon has the narrowest field of view, followed by the Canon that is a bit wider, then the Sony, and then the Tokina has the widest field of view. It is always interesting how lenses can have different perspectives at the same focal length. Okay, enough of that. Now for the part you have all been waiting for. The all-important image quality test. Some gear junkies would sell their own mother to get the sharpest lens possible. We will focus on each lens's three widest f-stops, where the green shading generally represents the greatest level of sharpness improvement. In this case, from f4 to f5.6, then f8 might get a little better, but then from f11 and beyond, you probably will not notice anything. The camera that I will be using for this test is a borrowed 42 megapixel a7R2, so many thanks goes to my friend Dave for lending it to me. We start off at 16 millimeters by looking at the center pineapple at f4 and by focusing on these three scales as the basis of reference. 
Now let's crop into the image to get a much better view. We are already looking at the lens in fourth place, and that is the Nikon. The Sony looked barely sharper than the Nikon for third place, but I was surprised to see that the Tokina was noticeably sharper than the Sony. And finally, the Canon was just a bit sharper than the Tokina for first place. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. At f5.6, the Nikon improved a little bit, but it wasn't enough because the other lenses were even sharper. In third place, the Tokina turned out a bit more detail than the Nikon, but the Sony was noticeably sharper than the Tokina. In first place is the Canon again, but the Sony was so close that even at 42 megapixels, it was almost a tie. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. The test at f8 was uneventful as the scores remained the same, even though the results differed from slowing down one stop. The Canon was the sharpest, but the Sony was so close it almost tied. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. Now let's go off to the more challenging part of the frame with the corner pineapple at f4. These will be the primary three scales of interest. The blurriest lens in fourth place was the Nikon. Coming in just a bit sharper was the Tokina, but second place got much sharper, and that was the Canon. In first place is the Sony, that resolved noticeably more detail than even the Canon. Corner performance always diverges more than the center does, so look at the difference between the first and the last. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. The scores at f5.6 all stayed the same, with the Sony in first place again showing them who's boss. So these are the first and the last places, and here are all four of them lined up. Finally at f8, the only thing that changed was that the Canon and the Sony both tied for first place. Each one seemed to have its own areas of strength, but overall I couldn't tell them apart. By the way, look at all the purple fringing on the Tokina, even at f8. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. Here in summary, first place is worth four points, and second place three, and so on. That was a slight victory for the Canon by two points over the Sony. Clearly 16mm at f4, the Canon was sharper in the center, while the Sony was sharper in the corners. With the Tokina and the Nikon, it is important to bear in mind that adapting ultra-wide-angle DSLR lenses to a mirrorless body can affect sharpness adversely in the teen millimeters. The intent of this video is to confirm the sharpness one may expect from these four lenses on a Sony E-mount camera, so DSLR shooters might have to take these results with some ambiguity. Now we move on to the 24mm test on the center pineapple at f4. We start out with the Nikon again in fourth place. As usual, the Tokina was third, then second went to the Sony. Once again, the Canon's f4 was the sharpest. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. At f5.6, this time the Nikon almost beat the Tokina for third place and the Sony almost beat the Canon for first place. Here they all are. At f8, the lenses all got sharper by stopping down, but the scores all stayed the same. So now let's go off to the corner pineapple at f4 to see if the scores will diverge more. The Nikon is in last again, but the Tokina was barely any better. In second place was the Sony that is much sharper than the Tokina, and the Canon was much sharper than the Sony. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. At f5.6, the lenses all got sharper and brighter by stopping down, but all the scores stayed the same. Finally at f8, the Sony and the Tokina tied for second place, and the Canon is on a conquest, just 
dominating the image quality category. Indeed, it is a sharp lens. So here are the scores for the whole test at 24 millimeters, and I admit to being disappointed that there has been no real close dueling as the Nikon was always fourth, the Tokina third, Sony second, and Canon in first. So unless the scores start getting more competitive, I will just move through the 35mm test a bit faster in order to just get to the point. So here we are at the onset of the center pineapple in the 35mm test at f4, and the scores were all the same again. The Canon continues to dominate. I am surprised that the Sony was so dull for second place standards though. Let's see if stopping down to f5.6 will make much of a difference. And yes, it does. The Sony is actually quite close to the Canon now. Too bad the Sony couldn't do so well wide open though. At f8, the Sony actually beat the Canon, but not by much. It was very close. Now let's head off to the corner pineapple at f4, but I'm going to move quicker because the scores are still all the same. At f5.6, the Sony almost matched the Canon, but not quite. F8 gets interesting because not only did the Sony win this time, but the Canon in second place was actually quite dull. In fact, that was the greatest margin over second place that the Sony has ever won so far. Nice. Plus, the Sony won the center and corner sharpness tests at F8, but it was the Canon that won those tests at F4 and F5.6, where performance is more important especially wide open. Now it is time to observe the final results of all the scores in this image quality test, and very evidently the Canon was the sharpest of the four lenses, with its best performance being at 24 millimeters. And get this, it gets even sharper when mounted on a Canon camera. The Sony turned out a rather mediocre performance, even though it scored a final total of 58 points for second place, its center image quality at f4 overall was quite unimpressive. Its f4 corner performance was better, except that at 35mm it was quite poor. This is a real letdown for Sony users, because the Canon's f4 overall was excellent. Here is an article that says, The lens is sharp from the center to the corners, and at 16 to 35 millimeters. I couldn't really ask for more. Well, sure you could. All one would have to do is compare it with the Canon, and then it would be seen that the Sony is really not as sharp as some people claim it is. Interestingly, this article said, Sony and Zeiss were able to engineer a small ultra-wide-angle lens without sacrificing image quality. Indeed, the Sony had its moments, but as we have just seen, most of them belonged to the Canon. My favorite review of the Sony was a video done by the Northrups, where Tony said that, but the only native superwide lens isn't that sharp. And you can adapt lenses, but it seems like you lose a lot of corner detail, at least at superwide focal lengths. I found Tony's input on the Sony lens to be among the few that was actually reliable, because even my own test results showed that in almost every case, the Sony was in fact duller than the Canon, and in some cases, much duller. Now imagine if I had tested the Canon lens on a Canon body, and pitted that against the Sony lens on a Sony body. I cannot confirm what the Tokina and Nikon lenses would have looked like on their respective DSLR bodies, but they, especially the Nikon, are evidently very dull lenses, at least when adapted to Sony mirrorless. Now after all that, let's finally move on to the next test, optical stabilization. The Canon comes equipped with its image stabilization the Nikon with its vibration reduction, and the Sony with its optical steady shot. But unfortunately the Tokina does not have in-lens stabilization. Due to the fact that the Nikon's VR does not work through my adapter, I borrowed a D810. Starting with the Canon lens, handheld, and no image stabilization.
and now it is turned on. Here is the Nikon lens on the D810 with its VR turned off. Now it is turned on. Here is the Sony lens with the OSS turned off. Now it is turned on. Now let's view them side by side at 100% crop. At 200% crop, we can really start to see that the Nikon is noticeably the jerkiest, while the Sony is steadier and the Canon is the steadiest. Here is a closer view at 400%. The Canon looks pretty steady, doesn't it? I meant to properly test them indoors for humming to know if they stabilized silently or not, but I forgot. Sorry. They seemed fine in this outdoor scene, though. In my experience, Canon IS is the best, but I've never tried out a Sigma OS yet. One of these days I will. Well that was quick, but moving forward now to the distortion test, all images shown will be at f5.6. At 16mm the field of view is so wide that it put the lens so close to the grid chart as to cast a shadow on it. There was nothing I could do about it, but fortunately it will not compromise this test. Just ignore it and the rest will go well. We will start off in 4th place with the Nikon lens that has the most barrel distortion in it. 3rd place improved a little bit over the Nikon, and that is the Canon. The Tokina just barely flattened out more than the Canon did, and the Sony had the least amount of distortion for 1st place, with its corner curvature being particularly flat for 16mm. The Sony is in an early lead with 4 points. At 24mm, surprising things are happening. The Sony actually had the most distortion by pincushioning. Talk about falling from a greater height. And third place did not go to the Nikon. It went to the Tokina. The Nikon overall was more linear, particularly in the horizontal axis. But the Canon beat them all with curvature that is almost perfectly square. Now the Canon is in the lead with 6 points. At 35mm, the Sony failed again with heavy pincushioning, still a problem. 4th place, the Canon also has a pincushioning problem, but not as bad as the Sony. The Tokina is starting to get somewhat linear now, but incredibly, the Nikon had the least amount of distortion at 35mm although the Tokino was very close, so it was really a matter of splitting hairs. This is the first time we have experienced this, but first place was a three-way tie between the Canon, Nikon, and the Tokina. One might want to settle the difference by pointing out that the Tokina was the most consistent overall, but that is subjective though. Now let's go to the vignette test, where light falls off in the corners using the three widest f-stops. We will be looking for the consistency of brightness from the center to the corners as a gradation of state change. Starting off at 16mm at f4 is the Sony in last place with the heaviest vignetting in the corners. And in third is the Canon that clears away much of the Sony's corner darkness. The Tokina is only slightly more consistent from center to corner and the Nikon is just a hair brighter than the Tokina for first place. At f5.6, the Sony is still the darkest, and the Nikon yields noticeably more corner light than the Sony. In second place, the Canon improved just a hair over the Nikon, while the Tokina ever so slightly reduces the fall off of light in the corners. I had to crop in closely to tell the difference because the Canon was close. At f8, the Sony still has problems with lots of fall off in the corners, while the Nikon brightens up those areas quite a bit. In second place, the Canon shows itself to improve just a little bit, 
while the tokina is more consistent from the center to the corners than the cannon. With 11 points from the 16mm test, that is the first time that the tokina has won something. Now at 24mm and f4, we start out with the Sony again, that does fine in the center, but its corners are dark. And in third place, the Canon is a bit brighter in the corners. Then the Nikon gets a bit brighter in the corners, but darker in the center, producing a shallower dynamic range. And finally, the Tokina is the brightest overall, with the most consistency from the center to the corners for first place. At f5.6, the Sony is still the darkest, followed by the Canon, then the Tokina, and finally first place goes to the Nikon, which was corner brighter than the Tokina by a percent or two. Now at f8, the Sony is where we would expect, but the rest were very difficult to distinguish. And so after staring at them for a while, I have decided that third place goes to the Tokina. After that, the Canon seemed to be just a bit more consistent from the center to the corners than the Tokina was, while the Nikon was the most consistent overall. This time the Nikon wins at 24mm with 11 points, but the Tokina still has the most total points. Now we will test the vignette at 35mm at f4 and... Amazingly, the Sony is not in fourth place. Rather, this time it is the Canon showing heavy light fall off in the corners. The Nikon makes a noticeable improvement, but in second place, the Sony actually makes a significant improvement. But the Tokina shows the most consistent brightness levels from the center to the corner. At f5.6, Unfortunately, the Sony gets kicked back to the curb in fourth place. The Canon is a little better. The Nikon clears up those dark corners really well, but the Tokina is on a conquest of the vignette test. Talk about bouncing back. At f8, the Sony is in last, followed by the Canon, then the Nikon, and finally, the Tokina wins again. It's a shame that the Sony did so poorly, because in previous videos I did, with different Sony lenses, they did really well in their vignette tests. This time a Tokina lens sat at the high table with distinction, while this Sony ultra-wide is licking plate like a dog in fourth place, with only 11 points. In this test, we are going to take a less clinical, but different look at each lens's maximum apertures, to see which lens at f4 has the most transmission of light from the front to the rear element of the lens. In other words, which is the brightest? We start off in fourth place with the Nikon, which doesn't surprise me because I have noticed that in the workflow of the entire shootout that the Nikon was always the darkest, overall at f4. In third place is the Canon being just a pinch brighter than the Nikon. And then next, I found that the Sony lens was always just a bit brighter than the Canon. In first place is the Tokina that is noticeably brighter than all the others. Not just in this scene, but for example in the grid chart, the Tokina was the only lens that I took all the photos at one-third of a stop darker than the settings that I used for the other lenses because the Tokina was so bright that it disrupted the consistency of exposure desirable for that particular test. Now it is time to move on to the bokeh test that will consist of seven tests. In the first test, we will crop into this tree in the upper left corner in 35 millimeters at f4, and that a7R2 is going to come in handy. The Canon's bokeh circles appear the hardest, and its out-of-focus region isn't so soft around the tree. And the Sony is a bit softer, though horizontal flaring is a bit of a problem. The flaring is almost completely gone with the Nikon, and the bokeh is softer than the Sony. But the Tokina appears perfectly smooth, just melting away the background. 
the Tokina is in the lead with four points. This time we will crop into this Quonset and the focus will be on the lateral joist and the edge rafter because they are symmetrical shapes. The scores were almost the same, starting with the Sony in fourth place this time. The Canon gets a bit softer, and while the Nikon's blurriness is smoother, edges appear to fringe harder, orangish. Once again, it all comes together with the Tokina lens, without fringing or hardness. Here is the first and the last side-by-side -side for comparison. The Tokina is now in a strong lead with 8 points. In this next scene, we will look at the hedges in the upper right corner of this backdrop. All four were very close, so if the viewer disagrees with me, I will understand. But I put the Sony in third place, then the Canon, and then finally the Nikon and the Tokina seem to be the same, so they tied for first. The Tokina is still in the lead, but only by two points. Now the focus will be on the grass backdrop next to the front of the chicken ornament at 16 millimeters. Not necessarily looking for bokeh shapes, rather just the softness of the background blur. But I found all four images to be so similar that second place was a tie between the Tokina, Canon, and the Sony. Only the Nikon stood out to me as being noticeably softer than the rest. The Nikon is closing the gap, but the Tokina is still in the lead. Now we move on to the first outdoor bokeh ball test at night time by focusing on the center of the images at a dark exposure. In fourth place is the Sony because the bokeh circles are the smallest with the hardest edges. The Nikon circles look like lunar surfaces, but at least they are bigger and have smoother edges. The Tokina's bokeh balls are nice and rounder, although they do have strong thumbprint patterns. And finally, the Canon does get lemon-shaped in the corners, but in the center they are very smooth, very round, and do not have hard edges like a stop sign. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. That was a big win for the Canon, but it is nowhere near enough to catch up. Now let's take a look at the same images at a bright exposure, where they do look a bit different. The scores are all the same as the dark exposures, but let's take a look anyways. The Sony still has the hardest edges. The Tokina's circles are bigger and a bit rounder, but flaring is a problem. The Nikon isn't quite as round, but the colors are warmer, and flaring isn't as bad. And the Canon is once again the smoothest and roundest in the center of the image. Here are all four of them side by side for comparison. The Canon is closing the gap, but the Tokina is still leading. In this final test, we are looking to see how the bokeh balls retain their rounded shape as they move from the center to the corner of the image. Interestingly enough, we start out with the Canon in last place, as its bokeh circles get quite lemon-shaped the closer they get to the corners. In third place, the Nikon is a bit rounder. Next in second, the Tokina is a bit rounder than the Nikon. And finally, the Sony doesn't lemonize at all in the corner. But it's not enough to secure even third place. And the Tokina wins the bokeh shootout with an overall score of 23. Next is the close-up test to see how close each lens can focus to a subject. We start off in fourth place with the Sony, which is quite typical in my experience. Sony lenses' close focusing distances tend to be further off. In third place, the Tokina is barely any better, but the Canon gets noticeably closer. In first is the Nikon, but really it is only closer by a hair. So just for fun, would you like to see what the Nikon looks like compared to a 1 to 1 ratio macro lens? There you go, no contest. Here is the Nikon and the macro side by side for scale. Now, what would a super zoom look like compared to the Sony? <laughs> 
Those things don't necessarily focus very close. So here it is. Bam. Yeah, that's definitely far away. Here they are side by side for perspective. All in all, these four lenses are all quite similar in their close-up performances, so no real worries there. In a previous video I did, the last place got absolutely creamed by the first, so it can happen. Alright, moving on. Next we come to the weight test, but we will start off by weighing the adapters. The Photodiox Nikon adapter weighs 110 grams. The Comlight adapter weighs 151 grams. And the Sigma adapter weighs 124 grams. Now for the lenses, we will weigh the Canon first, with no caps, hood, or adapters. Just the lens itself. Now the caps go on. Now the caps come off and the hood goes on. Now the Comlight adapter goes on, and now it weighs 797 grams. But with the Sigma adapter, combined weight becomes 771 grams. Now it is time to weigh the Nikon lens, with the body alone coming in at 682 grams. Now the caps go on. Now just the lens and the hood. And finally the lens with the hood and the adapter. Now it's the Sony's turn. Now I'll put the caps on. Now the lens with the hood. Finally we do the Tokina. Here is the lens alone. And with the caps. And with the hood. And now when the Comlight adapter is attached, the combined weight is 785 grams. But with the Sigma, the weight reduces to 759 grams. So in summary, this chart is tailored to Sony E-mount camera users, and is a bit complex, but we are really only looking at the numbers highlighted in green, which is the column representing the weight of the lens with its hood and adapter if needed. In this test, the Sony lens on a Sony body has a clear advantage over the competition, being 207 grams lighter than the second place Tokina. The Nikon is a real pig of a lens and feels very front heavy and is 161 grams heavier than the Sony, even without the adapter. Of course, DSLR users are welcome to make their own sense from the data. Now let's move on to the sun flare tests. This will consist of four different tests, and no sun hoods will be used. We start off with the 16mm test against the sun using f8. In fourth place is the Sony because it has a very large flare ring around the sun. That big flare ring is gone with the Nikon, but a cluster of small flares can be seen at the 9 o'clock position. In second is the Tokina that produces very little flaring, but excessive light is blooming around the sun. And finally, the Canon controls flaring and blooming the best. The Canon is in the lead with 4 points. Now we will do the same test but at 35mm. And in last place is the Tokina because blooming is quite severe here. The Sony's blooming is much better but it still has a problem with a small but bright blue 9 o'clock flare and excessive god rays from the sun. The Nikon had the least amount of 9 o'clock flaring, but its blooming is worse than the Tokina. In first place is the Canon. Even though it has a small bright white speck of flaring in the fore, the Canon had the least amount of blooming and so contrast is well controlled. The Canon is now in a strong lead with 8 points. Now let's take a closer look at the shape of the sun stars at f16. I will be using the classic pointed star shape as the basis, and this is a subjective test. So, here we go. In last place is the Nikon with its many armed, short, and dim rays of light. In third place is the Tokina with much more defined light rays than the Nikon, except that blooming is diffusing the star shape too much, and the rays are too short. 
The Sony in second place doesn't have a blooming problem, and the number of rays are about right, but the seeding of the rays are inconsistent, and some of them are too long. In first place, I think that the Canon's God rays look just right, with a decent number of rays diffused nicely that are neither too long nor too short, and the seeding is perfectly consistent all the way around, too. The Canon is just dominating the Sunflare category, leading now with 12 points. Here is another test, this time at night with a flood lamp at 24mm and f8. The Nikon came in last because of a very harsh 3 o'clock flaring. If I freeze it here, it can really be seen. None of the other lenses did this. Third place was a tough call because the Tokina has a real blooming problem, but it's not as bad as that huge flare from the Nikon. The Sony didn't have a problem with blooming like the Tokina, but there is a distracting green flare at the bottom. Once again, the Canon's resistance to both flaring and blooming is spot on. That was a perfect sweep for the Canon with 16 points, just towering over the Sony in second place. Indeed, the Canon lens controls flaring really well. Last up is the chromatic aberration test, those wavelengths of light that get refracted away from a common focal plane, causing green and purple color fringing. We will do two tests here, starting off at 35mm and f4. This was a tough test to judge because the results in this open book text test were so close that I'm going to draw a three-way tie between the Canon, Nikon, and the Tokina for first place, which were also very similar to each other in color temperature. In second place, the Sony, apart from being noticeably cooler, was the only lens that really stood out from the rest, because the green and purple fringing is pronounced here. So let's stop it down to f5.6 to see if much improvement occurs. Now f8, and now f11. So yes, it does improve by stopping down, but then again, what lens doesn't? Here we can see how the Canon on the left shows itself to be warmer than the Sony. But what would the Sony's fringing look like if it were color matched to the Canon? There we go, and already we do see an improvement. The fringing is still there, but not as much as was seen in the ungraded version. Since this method is hypothetical and not out of the box, I'm going to just stick with the ungraded results to keep it simple and natural. But scientifically, it's definitely something to think about in the process of your workflow. At 16mm and f4, the chroma levels are all very close, so it's hard to make a proper call there. But remember in the sharpness test when we saw that the Tokina's corner pineapple at 16mm, even at f8, fringed quite badly? That's definitely a demerit for the Tokina, so I'm giving it third place. Anyway, here are all four images of the lower left page in the corner at 16mm side by side for comparison, and we can see their fringing, but without seeing, incongruently, the Tokina as obviously the worst. Actually, I think the Sony looks the worst, but I'll give it second because the fringing Tokina on the pineapple is worse. The Canon and the Nikon appear to be about the same, so they tied for first place. I'm afraid that autofocus is excluded from this shootout for several good reasons. The A7S with adapters is not capable of autofocus. And while the A7R2 is, it would be with the Canon and Tokina, but not the Nikon because of the limitation of the adapter. There are other problems too, but so far I do not see a way to objectively test autofocus when non-Sony lenses are involved. So now after testing all the categories, it's finally time to draw some conclusions. The best lens to mount was the Sony because it didn't require an adapter. The best focus ring was on the Canon, but the Sony had the best zoom ring. Notice that the Sony is leading the total points now with a score of 10. The Canon had the best image quality and the best optical stabilization, and so the Canon is back in the lead again.
Somehow, the Canon, Nikon, and Tokina all tied for the best distortion control, but the clear winner of the vignette test was the Tokina. The Tokina also had the best light transmission, making it the brightest, and it had the best overall bokeh as well. Look at that, the Tokina is now tied with the Canon in the overall. The Nikon had the closest focusing distance, and the Sony is the lightest of the four lenses. The Canon and the Tokina are dueling for first overall again at 32 points each. The Canon had the best sun flare resistance, so that puts it back into first overall again. And finally, the Canon and Nikon tied for best chromatic aberration performance. And the winner of the shootout is the Canon. But I'm hardly surprised, as there was always something special about this lens. I really thought that the Sony would beat the Tokina though. And in Canada, the Tokina is only about 35% of the cost of the Sony. What a shocking difference. But to be fair, and balance this out a little bit, and address something important that shouldn't be overlooked, is that the Sony lens does enable autofocusing on cameras like the A7S, while others do not. So if you look at it that way, then the Sony would be the second place finisher. Then that one feature alone could prioritize the Sony over the rest, irrespective of the scores. And that is understandable. Remember that numbers are subjective, not objective. Now, if I was in the market for one of these lenses, personally, I would choose the Canon. I actually own this copy of the Tokina, but now that I've done this shootout, that's going to change. <laughs> I'm getting rid of it. The Canon is better. Unfortunately, the Sony is overpriced, and it was only a mediocre experience anyways. Just as a side note, I have seen countless singular data point reviews, articles, and videos on all four of these lenses, where praises are often extolled excessively and arbitrarily. Rarely, if ever, do these sources make comparisons from one lens to another directly and empirically. But if such was the case, then many of these reviews would have gone in another direction. Of that, I am confident. And so do encourage the viewer to try and rely on the multiple data point review system, wherever available. Particularly because lenses are expensive and your hard-earned money is on the line. Congratulations if you made it this far. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. I have aspirations to make more of these shootout videos, but they are expensive and time-consuming. I have a Patreon page if anyone would like to support me. Otherwise, thanks again for watching, and see you next time.